of you that don't know, my Sunday school class has been going through uh, the Bible somewhat chronologically since the beginning of the year. And we're reading a little bit from the Old Testament, and then we're taking a break, and we're reading a little bit in the New Testament, and we go back to the Old Testament. Well, one of the passages that we read a couple weeks ago was from Mark chapter 6. And the story that we're going to read today is not, it's not unfamiliar, which I guess means it's familiar to you, right? It's one that you've heard probably many times before, but the more that I kept reading it, and there was a portion in there that just stopped me in my tracks. And it's as if some of these passages were just jumping out at me. And you know what I mean by that? You read the Bible and some scriptures just jump out at you that make you stop. Well, this is one of those stories. Again, it's a story that I've read numerous times. It's one of the stories where Jesus walks on the water. Uh, and so it's nothing that I've not read before. But I guess just what we've been going through and how the Spirit's been leading me uh, there's been some pretty cool things I want to, to share with you. I'll be honest, this sermon is going to be more like a Bible study. Uh, so I'm going to jump around just a little bit in some various passages. I'm going to preach, but it's going to be more Bible study-esque in how I approach this, just because there's some things in there I really want you to, to get and understand so that you fully try to fully understand what's going on in Mark chapter 6. So uh, if you would stand with me, please, as read uh, Mark chapter 6. Uh, and we're going to start at verse 45. Mark chapter 6, verse 45, and we're going to go through 51. Mark 45, I'm sorry, Mark 6, 45 through 51. This is the word of the Lord for us today. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida. While he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken... Uh, leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening had come, uh, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they saw, uh, for they saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astonished. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word today. Lord, this may be a familiar passage for most of us, but God, I pray that you would open our hearts, that you would help to see these things in a new light. Lord, I pray that you would uh, speak through me today. That God, the words that are said are not my own, but Father, they're more of you. And Lord, that you would be glorified above all else. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. You may be seated. So again, there are several things in this passage that just stopped me in my tracks and caused me to focus a little more on what's going on. Uh, what I want us to understand is that this story is a powerful reminder of who Jesus is and what he does for us. He is our great Savior and comforts us in our times of need. Again, hopefully by the end of this message you'll, you'll understand that a little more. For us to understand what's taking place in Matthew or in Mark chapter 6, we need to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter, you say, how in the world are you going to make that relate? God is good, amen? amen? So listen to this. All the way back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it reads this. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Darkness was hovering over the face of the deep. That word deep there is what I want to focus on for just a few moments. In Hebrew, the word used for deep is tehom. Now, you know what I'm going to ask you to do. Let's say that together. Tehom. You now know Hebrew. What did you just say? The deep. Literally translates to the deep. But other translations of the word tehom also means the abyss. 
And so Matthew, or sorry, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 can be translated literally to, and darkness was over the face of the abyss. When we think of the word abyss, nothing good ever comes to mind, right? If only there's some negative connotations to that. We'll get to that here in just a minute. In the New Testament, the Greek word, or the Greek word for abyss is pretty simple. It's not tehom, as it is in Hebrew. It's abusos, not applesauce. Now you're going to remember what abyss is in Greek, because applesauce, abusos, right? It's in your bulletin, too, if you want to know that. Uh, the Greek word for abyss means bottomless, unbound, the pit, uh, and or a very deep gulf or chasm in the lowest parts of the earth used as a common receptacle of the dead and especially as the abode or the dwelling place of demons. Pretty cool. The word abyss, at least in the ESV translation, the English Standard Translation or version, is only written of, only spoken of, two times in the New Testament. Once in Luke chapter 8, and Luke chapter 8 is kind of a correlation to what takes place in Mark chapter 4 and Mark chapter 5 when uh, Jesus is sailing with his disciples over the Sea of Galilee. A great storm comes that wake Jesus up from his much needed nap. Jesus gets up, calms the waters, and looks at the disciples and says what? You have little faith. Right? That's kind of what we see in Mark, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 8. It's also mentioned in Romans chapter 10 as well. And so again, Jesus calms the storm uh, in Luke chapter 8, tells the disciples, you have little faith. Why could you not have faith, at least in me, even as I am asleep? But they were crossing the Sea of Galilee into the Decapolis. Are you with me? Tehom means deep, sea, right? It also means the abyss. Uh, in, in Greek, we see abyss or abyssios, and, and it means bottomless, a pit, uh, this large chasm, this gulf where the demons dwell, right? We're in the same page. So Jesus is sailing over what? A sea, the Sea of Galilee, as it's so named, right? And he's going to what's called the Decapolis. Uh, this is a region off the east and southeast coast of, of the Sea of Galilee, uh, commonly called the Decapolis, and this stands for ten cities, and they were north of Perea, uh, and it belonged uh, to the tribe, or to the half-tribe of Manasseh. It was so called for the ten cities uh, that lay within its border. Matthew calls this the region of uh, Gardenaeus, uh, because Jesus was near our, uh, Gadara in Matthew chapter 8. Why in the world am I telling you this? Most of you are like, yeah, pastor, get to your point. Amen? Right? What, what are you doing here? Uh, during Christ's time on this earth, the Decapolis was Gentile. What does that mean? It was a place that not many Jews went. It was probably not a place where uh, Jews wanted to go because there were a lot of Gentiles that lived there. It was a very strong Greek influence there as well. So Jesus and the disciples were crossing over the Sea of Galilee uh, into this Gentile land. You could argue that because it was Gentile land, it was unclean. And some of the things that they saw there, some of the things that they experienced, some of the things that were taking place in the Decapolis would have been blasphemous for the Jews. Why? Because they were Jews and they were going to the place where the Gentiles lived. Gentiles, anybody that is not a Jew. So Jesus and his disciples were crossing over the abyss, the sea, to get to Gentile lands. None of that makes any kind of sense, okay? For the disciples, this must have been mind-blowing to them in a way. Why are we going to that side of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus? What is over there? Why is it so important that we need to go over there and minister to those people? Obviously, Christ, I came to love and die for all, right? And so he wants people to know who he is, the importance of what he is. And so in Matthew chapter 5, there's another verse for us, or chapter for us. Well, when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, when they get to the other side, when they get to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, they stepped out of the other boat, or the, the boat, and immediately they were met with a man who was out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore. Not even with chains. 
for he had often been bound with shackles and chains. But he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. The abyss, the dwelling place of demons, just on the other side were the tombs, the unclean tombs, if you will. And someone there, a Gentile, was unclean, possessed by an unclean spirit. Jesus asked the unclean spirit, you know this, he asked the unclean spirit, what is your name? What does the spirit say? For we are many, my name is Legion. Legion. Think about this for just a moment. Jesus and his disciples get to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. They step foot on Gentile land. The first thing that they see is an unclean spirit. We are Legion. The next sign of uncleanliness is then revealed as Legion begged not to be driven out of his country. A herd of pigs, 2,000 pigs, were seen on the hillside. Are pigs good for Jews? No. That's a no-no. Don't go buy them. Don't eat them. Don't smell them. Don't do nothing with pigs, right? Man, we had some ham yesterday. You ever had twice smoked ham? Can I get an amen, somebody? Amen. That's delicious. That's born one. Woo! I'm doing that from now on. I was good. Anyways, pigs, 2,000 pigs were on this hillside. Again, that was a no-no for Jews. Luke 8 records that Legion begged Jesus not to command them to depart into the what? Abyss. What did Jesus just cross over? The abyss, the sea, the place where demons dwelled, supposedly. Jesus steps foot. Immediately, he's faced with this Gentile man, this unclean man, possessed with these unclean spirits. And the demon says, don't cast me into the abyss. Don't send me back from where I came. This makes a little more sense in Luke chapter 11, verse 24. Do you know that when demons are cast out, listen to what happens. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. I would have never got that if it weren't for what took place in Mark chapter 6. Demons cast out. They, they search from place to place, waterless places, seeking rest. What's the first thing that surprises me in this passage is that Jesus honors Legion's request. He doesn't immediately send him out into the abyss. What does he do? He sends him to the what? The pigs. He sends them into the pigs. Those demons, Legion himself, was cast out into the pigs. Then the pigs rushed down the steep embankment into what? The, abyss. the sea, the abyss. Come on, y'all. Y'all staying with me on this? This is some good stuff. This is some good stuff. The pigs themselves go into the abyss. They go down the embankment, go into the sea, into the abyss. Although Jesus didn't drive out the demons into the abyss, the pigs went there. It's like they instinctually knew <laughs> What to happen? And pig, people say pigs are dumb. Uh, the pigs drowned in the sea, the bottomless, unbound chasm, and the lowest part of the earth, used as a common receptacle of the dead, and especially as a place where demons dwell. It's as if the demons went back from where they came. This sets up Mark chapter 6. All of what we just talked about, as confusing as that may have been, this sets up our passage in Mark chapter 6. This sets up an amazing revelation that the disciple had missed in the midst of the chaos that was taking place in Mark chapter 6. After Jesus, so if we go back to our text here, we see that Jesus did several things in Mark chapter 6. Uh, we see that he's rejected in his hometown of Nazareth. So he's going and he's teaching, and he says, no. Uh, what you're doing, Jesus, we, we don't necessarily think you're the Son of God, so you need to leave. So he does so. And he then prepares the twelve, the apostles. He says, look, when you go, uh, there's going to be some people in the various cities that you go to that aren't going to like you. And if they don't like you, you're going to kick the dust off at the beginning of that uh, city and then move on to the next. Because they're, don't waste your time on them. They're just not going to listen to you at all. And then we get to this point where uh, the death of John the Baptist is talked. 
right? Where, where here this uh, Herod uh, asked for John the Baptist's head on a platter. Well, actually, it was, it was uh, one of the ladies, right? It's amazing what guys will do for ladies, right? Even bringing someone's head on a platter. It's kind of, eh. I wonder if, no. So, uh, so, so all this takes place. He finds out that John the Baptist is dead. And then he goes to a remote place. Why? To grieve, to mourn the loss of John the Baptist, his cousin. Then what happens? A large crowd is following him. And they say, Jesus, we're hungry. They've been traveling with Christ for quite a while, Scripture says. Jesus looks out. He asks for the kids' lunchbox, right? Give me your bread and your fish. I'm going to pray to the Father. He's going to multiply that. The 5,000 plus their families were fed, were fed. John tells us that this was such a miraculous event for those involved that they wanted at that point to make him king. That they were so overwhelmed at what was taking place that they witnessed Jesus feed 5,000 people or 5,000 men plus their families that they wanted to immediately force him to, to be king. This is why in verse 45, immediately Jesus told his disciples, go away. There's fixing to be a political uproar. There's fixing to be some, some, some political sway here that's going to take place that you don't need to be a part of. I'm fixing to clarify it. I'm fixing to set them straight, but you need to go away so that you're not involved with what's fixing to happen. The disciples then get in a boat. They are sailing away in the Sea of Galilee over the abyss, right? Once again, Jesus then tells the crowd. He, he prays for them, does whatever. He sends them on their way. And then what does Christ do? Go up in the mountains. Christ begins to seek God. Yeah. Christ begins to seek God. Seek the Father. Praise to the Father. Here's what's awesome. The second thing that jumped out to me in this passage. Scripture says that while they were a long way from land, Jesus saw them. Good job for Jesus. They were three or four miles in the water. It's a long way from where they were, where they just set sail from. Jesus is on the side of this mountain. He finishes praying. Maybe while he's praying, he looks out and he sees his disciples, and they're struggling. Painful headway, Scripture says. The wind was so strong. The, 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 uh, the waves were so high. They were sailing over the abyss. What happens when we're in our abyss? The winds are strong. The storms are strong. The waves sometimes are high. And when we're in that place where we don't think we can get out of, sometimes it seems like we're just going to be trapped there forever. What happens next? Christ walks on the water Amen. to them. Glory. Amen. Amen. I got chill bumps on that one. Yeah. Christ is walking on the water. I want to. So if Jesus is walking on the water, I want to know what his forty-yard sprint is. Because he gets from the top of that mountain right there beside them on that boat pretty quick. He's walking on water. He sees their struggles from a long way off. And he wanted to do something about it. Whew. Do y'all get that this morning? Come on. The disciples were over the abyss. They were over this demon-possessed water. Whatever word, whatever translation you want to say there. They were confused. They were in chaos. Christ says, I can help you. Christ says, I can help you overcome that. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so he runs beside them. He sees their struggle, and he runs beside them three to six miles into the Sea of Galilee. Jesus is up on the top of this mountain, sees their need, and immediately says, i got to do something. Glory. So he comes down the side of the mountain, and Scripture says, this is another thing that just tripped me up. It says that Jesus was passing by them. Notice it didn't say that Jesus stopped when he got to the boat. It says that he was going to pass by them. This is super important for us to understand this morning. It says it was about the fourth watch. What does that mean? In Roman times, the way they kept time, it was probably three to six in the morning. The fourth watch, right? When soldiers, they would all rotate their watches. So here, uh, as the other disciples were trying to get some sleep, the ones that were up watching, seeing how bad the storms were going to be, notices something in the water. And they say, it's a ghost. That makes sense because they're traveling over the abyss where the demons live. If things clicking now, isn't that awesome? 
So let's continue to, to see what goes on. So a uh, commentary suggests this. Jesus is passing by them. If this story is understood in terms of the revelation of who Jesus is, then the phrase must best be understood as an intertextual allusion to the revelation of God. What does that mean? Intertextual, that means there's a lot of different texts, there's a lot of different references that taking place. One of them is Exodus 34, uh, 34, 5, and 6. The Lord passed by Moses. And Moses said, The Lord, the Lord, a God of mercy and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Did Moses see God? No. Moses did not see God in that moment. As a matter of fact, God said, You've got to turn your back on me. And when I turn, when I pass by you, don't look at me because you can't stand to see me. That's how, that's how glorious I am, right? Amen? On the same page? Y'all remember that? We need to go back and read that. If not, that's good stuff. 1 Kings 19.11, Elijah uh, was told to stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. What happened when Elijah was on the mountain? Where was he looking for God? The earthquakes, the storms, the tornadoes, the lightning, the eruptions. And Christ came to him and what? Or God came to him and what? A whisper. Did he see God in that moment? No, he did not. The disciples are struggling. They're in distress. They are in chaotic waters. Who do they see? God. Amen? Amen. Yeah. They see God in that moment. Come on. Why do you say they see God in that moment? Because Christ looks at him, as he said in Exodus chapter 3, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, in Isaiah 41, and he says, it is I, I am who I am. Christ says, I am Yahweh. Don't be afraid, for I am here standing in front of you. Yeah. Amen, brother. Not only that, but I'm here to help you. Come on, that's good preaching. Scripture says he gets in the boat. And what happens when he gets in the boat? Water stops. The chaos is calm. Yeah. The storm ceases in that moment. Thank That's the Lord. second time the disciples have experienced that. And their mind is still utterly blown. Yeah. Verse 51, they were astonished at what they had just witnessed. I don't know about y'all, but some of us are in some chaotic waters in our lives. Some of us may feel like we're in the abyss, where demons are coming against us left and right. That still happens today. Yes. And God is saying, I'm here to help you through that struggle, and I'm here to help you in those chaotic moments. You just have to look to me yeah. and say, Lord, help me. It says the disciples cried out. Yeah. We got to cry out sometimes. God, you know the situation I'm in, but he's waiting for us to say, what do you need me to do? Amen? Yeah. What do you need me to do? God, this is the situation. This is the struggle. This is the demons that I'm facing. Alcoholism, drug addiction, whatever it is, the sin that has so overcome me in my life. Christ says, just reach out, cry out to me, yeah. and I will help you. Praise God. For I see you in your struggles when I'm a long way off. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And I'm going to run beside you, and I'm going to grab you by the hand. This story in Luke, Peter steps out on the water. What does he do? Peter then walks on the water. Then he takes his eyes off of Christ, and what happens? He sinks. But he also says, Lord, help me. Jesus immediately is there to pick him up. They both get in the water. Or they both get in the boat in the waters. The water's calm. Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. It is I, Jesus says. Christ is saying, I am more powerful than the Sea of Galilee. I am more powerful than the abyss. I am more powerful than the place where demons dwell. I'm more powerful than the ones that are over the demons. I am who I am, Christ says. More powerful than the deep the bottomless, unbound chasm in the lowest part of the earth known as the receptacle of the dead. That's the dwelling place of demons. I don't know if you caught this, but God himself even pointed to this way back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. The spirit was hovering over the waters, over the face of the waters. We've got reassurance of peace all the way back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. God created 
And in the midst of that chaos, it says that the Spirit hovered over the face of the waters. Amen? Yeah. We see that all the way back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. We also see here many times in the New Testament, this is more than just the gospel of, of Mark. It happened in the gospel of John. It happened in the gospel of Luke as well. Jesus walks on the water. The disciples see God. They see Christ. And he says, take heart, for it is I. Jesus truly has power and authority over chaos. Demonic entities. Christ, we don't like to talk about that. But can I tell you, Christ has authority over those things? Christ drove legion into pigs. Last week we talked about how the Pharisees looked at that and said, only Satan can do that. What? Why would Satan do that to himself? Right. Christ says, no, 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 no. I am who I am. That's why it happened. I am who I am. The struggles that we have in life, we think that how we overcome these things, it's the I am that helps us overcome them. Amen. It's Christ saying, it is I. Take heart, for I am with you. In the midst of these crazy, tumultuous moments, I am with you. Again, this story is a powerful reminder for us. It's not just the story about Jesus walking on water. Again, we miss this if we don't take a look at what happens in other places in Scripture. We look at that and say, wow, cool, Jesus has the authority to defy gravity and walk on water. Ooh, right? When I was a kid, that's what I thought. Man, Jesus is pretty cool. I want that power. It's more than just the authority of walking on water. It's more than just the authority of calming storms, which to me makes no sense. Mark Skirtle can't even do that. <laughs> That was a good one. Yeah. Was good. <laughs> it's the authority of God through Christ that's at work in this world and in our lives. <clears throat> this story is a reminder that Christ is God. That he sees our struggles even from a long way off. That he comforts us in the midst of those struggles. And then he also helps us overcome those struggles as well. Notice Jesus didn't remove the disciples from the water. He didn't even remove them from the boat. He didn't remove them from the, the chaos at that moment, what was going on around them. Instead, Jesus calmed them all. He said, I'm here with you. Yeah. We still got to get to the other side. We might still catch a storm or two. But have no fear, for I'm with you. To the end of the earth. To the end of the ages, Christ says. May we continue to have faith in the one who has all authority, all power, and is so gracious and merciful to us in our times of need. If you would stand with me, please, as we close in prayer.